Good evening, everybody. It's Tuesday, 22nd July, 2014. Uh, my name is Michael Port, and we're here with another EMEA V Brown Bag. This evening, we have the pleasure of uh, Phil Monk, who's a senior consultant for VMware PSO in EMEA, um, who I know has been doing a lot of work on VCAC, um, and is going to be talking to us uh, about uh, VCAC um, uh, architectural decisions. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to him. Uh, as always, if there's any questions, feel free to uh, ping them into the questions window, the chat window, or via Twitter using the V Brown Bag hashtag. And uh, I'll see if I can get them answered for you. Uh, anyway, Phil, over to you. Thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Phil. Um, I'm from VMware PSO, as Mike said. Uh, working in the Northern Amir region, um, currently delivering a lot of projects around um, the vCloud Automation Center, uh, focusing mainly on the cloud automa automation pieces, including vCenter Orchestrator, Advanced Services Design, and uh, our X as a Service offering as well. <coughs> this uh, today, this presentation is around the architecture of uh, VCAC6. Um, I've been in many meetings where we've um, we've discussed. Uh, how we're going to outlay some of the components, and there's very uh, different views on things, there's different use cases, um, some of the information that we've learnt over the last um, sort of year or so when I've been running projects and design workshops. I just thought it'd be good to share with everyone uh, reasons for maybe uh, differing from our reference architecture and maybe expanding on what some of the reference architecture terms mean as well. Uh, now, I know it's normal to have a, an About Me page on these presentations. I don't have an About Me page because normally they contain all your Twitter and your blog posts, etc., etc. I can't say I'm an avid uh, participator in social media. Um, my um, tweet, you can tweet me on my um, Twitter account if you would like. Uh, that's included in some of the uh, broadcasts that have been publicised for this uh, presentation, but I, I don't particularly use it very much, so I don't expect a quick response. Okay. So we'll, we'll delve straight in. Um, we have. Uh, you'd have to, uh, first of all, I'd like to apologise if there's any mistakes on these slides. They were put together pretty quick because I've been um, working on a lot of projects lately with some quite tight deadlines, so this was done in my, uh, my spare time. Um, so the, uh, the external server, we've got several things that you need to consider when we're designing the physical architecture of a VCAC6 instance. Now, the, uh, these differ quite a bit from 5.2 because we have some additional components. Uh, we introduced the identity appliance and the VCAC appliances, which is also known as the cafe appliance, to um, try and sort of remove some of the Windows components. And you'll see that in, in more and more releases that we do of, of VCAC. There'll be more and more functionality phased out of Windows components and into um, more uh, appliance-based Linux um, applications. Uh, I'm not by all means saying that the next release 6.1 is going to include no Windows components at all, because it does. It's probably going to be a, a long, long time before there are no Windows components in this setup at all. But where we have the opportunity, we're going to be moving things to our, our appliance-based approach. So if we start from the top, um, so one of the things we have to consider before we can put in any VCAC infrastructure are the external services. These include things like Active Directory, um, your uh, database setup, what, what you currently got in the customer's estate. Um, now we we get this uh, these questions a lot around whether we're going to set up um, integrate into an existing Active Directory and existing infrastructure services with existing SQL boxes, uh, existing mail servers, etc. We uh, we very often recommend um, that we sort of set up a brand new one. So we would look at maybe having a, a cloud management stack, but we would just have um, a cloud management active domain, a cloud management SQL box, et cetera, et cetera. Now, sometimes we'll not all customers don't like that approach, so, so we, we sometimes accommodate for, um, for their infrastructure as well. But we tend to recommend that if this is going to be a big multi-tenant service provider or big multi-tenant internal for a huge global national company, that we, we, sort of, we, we start from an active directory's perspective and we try and keep everything easy to manage and isolated. So we look at our VCAC nodes, so our next steps, so we look at things like the appliances, our uh, IWS components. Uh, we also look at our virtual center orchestrator, uh, 
when we're using the active um, device services designer, sorry, we and the Exodus service, we need to make sure that BCO is it is something that we make highly available, we make resilient. Um, if we're going across multiple sites, we need to make sure that when we publish workflows, they synchronise between the different sites where orchestrators contained. It's uh, it's something that very often gets overlooked, um, even though it's very critical to to most BCAC deployments. We then look at the load balancing components. So these will be load balancing things like the, the appliances, the um, IAS components, the vCenter orchestrator if we're running it in a cluster mode, um, different components inside VCAC load balance in different ways. We look at things like certificates and what requirements we would need from the load balancer and the certificates to satisfy customer requirements around availability. These can be things like uh, manual intervention is needed on some of the components to be able to fail them over. Um, if we want that automated and seamless, then, then we need to have uh, consideration for, for, for what we configure on the load balancer and what capabilities we configure in. We then look at our uh, demo orchestrator workers. So we uh, we look at where we place these. These are the, um, the nodes that do do the grunt. They do all of the um, workflow running if we're doing um, VCAC workflows. If we're obviously calling out to, to VCO in stub workflows, then there are workflows that are paused on on these manager servers and we need to be able to look at how many workflows we're going to run, how intensive those workflows are and we need to, to decide where we're best going to place these components and how we're best going to scale them. We then look at the uh, VCAC agents. Now these are commonly vSphere agents and we do have agents for third party products um, but we very rarely see them implemented. Um, if someone uh, has an installation uh, where they're implementing one at the moment and they want to ask some questions about it. I can't guarantee that um, I'll be able to answer anything, but I'll definitely um, take your questions away and uh, and ask people that know and see if they can get back to us. So for this presentation, we'll be focusing on the vSphere agent. We'll be looking at how to make that resilient, where we place it, where the, if we place it on the DEMS, as in our reference architecture, or if we look at placing it on the um, virtual centers themselves, or if we in fact use dedicated boxes or um, some customers have a, uh, we've come across several customers that have got sort of proxy um, boxes that they, they use to run these sort of min, uh, minor agents on to be able to, to for other products as well as ours. Then look at our endpoints. Uh, we're going to focus on vCenter for this endpoint. It's the most common one we see used at the moment along with um, vCloud hybrid services. Um, we don't tend to see many vCloud director endpoints um, in our recent installs. We did see uh, quite a few in sort of 5.1, 5.2, but we tend to see more, more sort of vSphere focused ones now in PSI. Um, so I'm going to stop periodically and ask if there's any questions. Has anyone got any questions they want to ask around that? Or anything they want me to focus on specifically? I'll assume silence isn't though. It's a pretty safe assumption. <laughs> cool. Okay, so um, Whenever we do a design, we tend to build out a Visio diagram to explain a component. So this presentation will slowly build out the different components um, that we would expect to see in a, a VCAC distributed architecture. So um, as we discussed previously, our first components are Active Directory, our uh, Postgres database, our ITBM, our uh, SMTP email, and our SQL. So our, our Active Directory, uh, like I was saying previously, we recommend um, if we're doing a greenfield cloud installation, that we start with a new Active Directory. Um, there are many reasons for this. One of them is that uh, a lot of customers will have an Active Directory that's developed over a number of years, uh, been administered by multiple or people, multiple people in the support team or people that currently left um, and no longer work for the organisation. And you'll find that there'll be groups that will be hidden in other groups. There'll be users that necessarily aren't configured correctly. There'll be there'll be a whole world of, of stuff. I'm sure all of you guys are are aware of what a historic Active Directory can look like. Um, so we recommend to be able to, to document and very often to, to be able to provide some sort of regulatory tracking for, for maybe um, a government-based industry, for example. But we, we sort of start with a new Active Directory so we can give that level of security and that level of um, documentation as well as to what roles are configured for what and, and what talks to each other. Uh, the Progress Database. Now this is something that um, brings up a lot of discussions when we talk to customers. So we currently have, I move on to the next slide. We currently have two 
uh, documented ways of providing the Beam Progress database. Well, three actually, sorry, if we count the internal one. Um, so we can use an internal VCAC appliance database. This can um, obviously only support a single instance of VCAC appliance, which gives you a, a single point of failure in that appliance, not just for the, uh, for the database service, but for the actual appliance itself. So if we, if we were installing a, uh, a dish rigid architecture, we very often recommend that we use a pre-progress database appliance. <clears throat> this is something that um, we sell as VMware. It's a supported product. Um, it's a appliance like all of the other appliances, but you, you buy, you license, you download, um, you deploy it, and then it's, it runs through some scripts to configure itself at the uh, deploying the OVF stage. We don't offer uh, the vProgress database appliance in a clustered configuration. The protection of the vProgress database appliance will be uh, vSphere HA. Um, now that often brings up some questions with customers where we talk around what if that appliance becomes corrupt or fails. Um, we recommend that the appliance is backed up on a, on a uh, pretty short time window, maybe every couple of hours, and we do a whole uh, appliance backup because we don't support any um, agents being installed in any of our appliances because it deviates from a standard configuration. Um, so we do a whole appliance backup using VADP or an equivalent product. Um, and then if there is a corruption or there is a problem with the appliance and it's we restore from backup. We don't um, we don't offer any sort of clustering with this appliance at all. We then also offer the V Progress SQL, which is an open source, um, well it's not a tool, but it's an open source solution that's offered um, in the uh, by a third party company that we can deploy the appliance on uh, the appliance database onto. Um, this obviously isn't supported by uh, by VMware, it's supported by uh, open source or by a uh, third party vendor if you purchase it via that method. <coughs> we, um, we can offer database clustering on that as a supportable uh, configuration for the appliances. This very often isn't taken up by customers because if you're installing a, um, an enterprise wide VCAC installation, the last thing you want to want to do really if you're a customer is put in an open source tool that there isn't any real support around. So very often we, we ended up uh, installing the vProgress database appliance and then we um, set up the backup schedules to back it up at a very short backup window. This always brings up lots of questions um, in workshop meetings and whenever I'm speaking to people in the community. Um, has anyone got any questions around that? Shall I assume silence is no again? Okay, cool. If anyone has any questions around um, the support of that element, then, then please feel free to, to tweet me. Like I said, I might take a while to get back to you, but I will. Um, or uh, if you want to email me, I'm sure you can guess what my email is um, at VMware. Okay, so the uh, SMTP element of the, uh, of the external services, we very often integrate with a, um, a mailing system which is external to, uh, to the domain. Normally, if we're setting up a new Active Directory domain, people don't want to set up a new SMTP service just for a, for a cloud service. Sometimes if we have loads of um, advanced services and uh, loads of um, XAS services that require emails being sent out, quite often we will uh, put up an SMTP server in those cases, but the standard email stack doesn't require um, very often for, uh, for a dedicated email setup. And our SQL database, we support this, uh, clearly offer support for this on a cluster. Uh, we also offer support for this on an SQL mirror. Um, anything that, um, that you, you, you find, you, you will find conflicting um, support statements from VMware, but the, uh, you're never going to call GSS or Logical and they're never going to turn around and say, oh, we won't support that because it's on a mirror or it's on a cluster. We do support mirrors and we do support cluster databases. So that's, um, that's something that, that we often recommend for the IAS components but that's set up in that way. Okay. So we move on next to the, uh, the VCAC nodes. Now these include the ID appliance, the VCAC uh, cafe appliance as it's often referred to, the uh, IIS components, the manager service, the demo orchestrator, and vCenter orchestrator as well. Now the first thing you'll notice in that diagram as well is that the VCAC ID appliance is a single point of failure. There's a single appliance, um, there's no way of clustering it, there's no way of um, 
providing multiple appliances, etc., etc. The the only way to provide uh, high availability for the SSO elements or the, the ID services for VCAC is to utilize uh, the vCenter vSphere uh, SSO, which we can deploy in a multi-site node or a clustered configuration. You do have to have specific versions around that. I believe it's 5.5 um, update 1 um, that you, you need as a minimum, um, and you also need the latest release of VCAC for that to be supported. Um, that does remove uh, the single point of failure of the ID appliance and it, and it does actually provide you with um, a lot better management as well because you don't have to uh, you don't have to configure a, a second ID of ID source you've got a single um, SSO instance and a single ID source that you can configure and you can manage we um, we haven't in my experience deployed um, SSO um, from the vCenter to the appliances very often at the moment because it's only just recently come into a supported configuration. Um, so if you haven't seen that around, it's only, only because it's just been just been released. So the uh, the appliances we can run in an active active configuration. They both need to talk to the um, the Progress database appliance. The uh, VCAC um, IIS components they can be run in an active active configuration as well. Our manager service and our demo orchestrator are two components that can't be run in an active active configuration. They need to be run in an active standby or an active passive configuration. The reason for this is there can only be one orchestrator service and there can only be one manager service running at a time. So these services will be set to manual or in Windows services and uh, they'll be set to um, disable as well on startup. Now vCenter orchestrator in this diagram here we're configuring it in an active active configuration. So we're configuring a cluster mode. Uh, this will allow us to, um, to, to to keep some sort of resilience if one, one node fails while it's executing workflows. Uh, now, vCenter Orchestrator uses SQL tracking to be able to track where the workflow progresses. So if, for example, the, uh, the first appliance fails and it's halfway through running through a workflow, the second appliance will detect that failure and will resume the workflow from the stage at which the first appliance failed. And this is um, it's been something that's been in VCO for a very long time. Um, and it, it, it's, it's excellent. I've seen it work several times in, in big installations where we've had four, maybe six cluster nodes, and uh, we saw that we had a power loss at one customer, and uh, the two that were left out of the four, out, out of the six that were configured, they uh, picked up and queued the workflows that they couldn't run, and then resumed the workflows once they had uh, been able to track the database. All within a couple of minutes, uh, the customer hardly noticed any outage. <coughs> So uh, as I was discussing, that this, it's a single appliance, the uh, the uh, identity appliance. It's not an Active Directory appliance, so apologies for that. Um, and it can't be clustered. Um, alternatively, it's used to be center SSI. The VCAC Appliance Cafe uh, can be configured in a clustered configuration. Uh, database is internal when in single mode and external when in clustered configuration. That's self-explanatory. IIS components, Windows machines using IIS. Uh, they use external base database and is often in multiple mode configuration. Um, and IIS components include the manager dem, the orchestrator dem as well. And we've also got here uh, the multi-site plugin for VCO. So if we're running a, a distributed geo uh, configuration, we can use the multi-site plugin, which will, if when we publish a workflow to one node, will um, synchronize the, the, the nodes. Uh, SQL database and um, the workflow uh, library with all the other nodes around the world and it does it quite instantly as well uh, around the world in multi-geographical sites. <coughs> and if we have a look at the um, load balancing configuration, so this is more to outline the, the components that we can load balance and the virtual IPs that we need to configure as well as um, security and, and certificate requirements. So if we look at, uh, here we're using a, an F5 in this instance. This is, this is the most common load balancer I've seen when we've uh, been deploying services for or four customers that I've used to deploy this. Uh, other customers have tried to utilize the uh, edge appliances in, NS, in uh, NSX and in BCNS. They, uh, they offer load balancing services, but they don't offer some of the advanced functionality. Uh, BCNS doesn't, but um, the F5 can. Uh, NSX will offer all of the services you need, and it's um, it's very often an overkill to to configure NSX in the management cluster just to do this this level of load balancing. <clears throat> so we configure our virtual IP for the appliances, the uh, IS components, the VCAC manager, 
and the VCA cluster as well. Now, if we're looking at using uh, certificates from uh, which aren't self-signed from a company, which which many uh, companies, well, all companies that I've actually installed this in have used their own certificates, and they've been varying in the certificate types that we've used. Some have used internal CAs, uh, some have used uh, various signed certificates, uh, some have used set up new CAs and uh, in the management clusters and have used those to configure the, these uh, load balancing services. We um, we would obviously use some sort of SSL offloading if you want to mask the uh, IDs of the appliances and the components and the manager service behind as well as the VCO components. The certificates need to be issued by a root CA. They can't be intermediate certificates. Uh, some of the Linux appliances will not accept intermediate certificates or, um, or, or ones that aren't signed by the root CA. So our, um, our manager service, we were talking earlier about, about, um, about configuring this to, to sort of some seamlessly fail over. Uh, the manager service and the demo orchestrator service is always going to require some, some manual intervention with the services being set to manual. Some customers we've uh, we've actually implemented a VCA workflow which which goes off and, and fires everything up in a case of a failure or it actually detects when there's a failure and then goes up and it brings the services back up. If we use um, if we don't configure the demo orchestrator and the uh, manager service to have a, a VIP, then we, we need to load all of the components certificates onto those those services. And then when uh, when one of those services fails, the certificates aren't valid anymore, and you need to re-upload them. So, for example, if um, we've got demo the the first node there running, and then that node has the certificates of all of the appliances and the IS components, and they have its certificate as well. When that node fails, the certificate which is valid for the manager service and the orchestrator service isn't going to be valid anymore because that component's failed, and the other machine's going to have a different name and a different certificate. Even if we preload that certificate onto the uh, the appliances and the IS components, there's still difficulty in in bringing it up and running because it it doesn't see the uh, it doesn't see that the, the failover is being um, is being activated. It just sees it as an additional node and will keep trying to use the original one to just try and send instruction. So if we use uh, the VIP, uh, we use the certificate on that VIP as the, uh, to the appliances and the IS components, then we can actually they don't know any difference when the components fail. If we use SSL offloading, so they will just see that the services have gone down for a few seconds, and then when they come up on the passive node, they'll be up and running, and and they won't see a change in any certificates at all. Does that uh, does that make sense to people? Is, is there any questions around that? Cool. No problem. Okay, so load balance requirements. Uh, we use SSL offload for faster failover, uh, which is what we were just talked about with the manager and the orchestrator service. And we also we, we very often use NSX, VCNS, or we can use third-party load balances. If we're using VCNS, we can't use some of the um, some of the features like SSL offload, and we, we can't we can't use um, <coughs> we can't use some uh, load balancing features on based on on load because uh, VCNS only has round robin or last known connection configuration sticky sessions, you can't load balance it based on load as NSX or load balance based on a uh, load of servers and most third party tools as well. Okay, so the next stage we look at the dem workers. Now these are the like we discussed earlier were the components that um, will execute the workflows. Um, .NET workflows are executed on the components, VCO workflows, stub workflows are called out from these components and are the workflows that they're they're a member of pause while, while the BCO workflow is executed. <clears throat> so the, uh, the reference architecture states that most of these um, can be deployed with, with two down workers. And you'll see in this instance we've got we've got four deployed here. Now the the reason for this is we uh, <coughs> we have a lot of if you have a lot of um, advanced service uh, services and if you have a lot of uh, XAS services and they run off stub workflows or, or points in the machine lifecycle, then the machine lifecycle workflows that run from these down workers will will be more intensive and it will pause. And if we actually not just VCO workflows, but we also for customers sometimes code and, and deploy .NET workflows to do things inside VCAC that we can't do in VCO, uh, that's also quite intensive on these workers. 
these workers can run 15 concurrent workflows. That's a hard set limit. Uh, if they have any more than 15 requests concurrently sent to them, then their requests will be queued. Um, this includes uh, if it's, for example, like I was saying earlier, if we have a workflow that calls out to a stub and that's executed on VCO, uh, that stub, that master workflow or that, or that state will be paused on the, the dam worker until the VCO workflow completes and then it will finish. So if you've got something that is going off in VCO on the machine provision state and, and is, for example, adding to a CMDB, updating some uh, some databases somewhere with some customer information, is emailing people, is uh, is maybe even building something inside a virtual machine that's been provisioned, that could take quite a long time. So you, you would have a, a workflow that would be stuck and that would be running on um, on your demo worker while that's continuing. And then once that's finished and VCO sends back saying that it's finished executing that workflow, the stub will then finish and the machine lifecycle can continue. So for for, for scaling wise we we can scale these out and we can scale them up to a certain extent. So fifteen is a hard set limit. So there's only going to be so much resource you can give to it that they can use with those fifteen workflows. So our normal recommendation is two virtual CPUs per dem. Um, again, that's based on reference architecture. But if we're running something that's very CPU intensive, for example, we're um, we're going away and, and calculating something like a cost outside of VCAC, or, or calculating a, a a time a virtual machine can run, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then that um, that can be quite CPU intensive. So we can upscale the CPUs to four. Um, I've never seen a need for anything to be larger than four virtual CPUs on a dem. And very often they're deployed between. 8 and 16 gig of RAM. Um, 16 gig is it's probably quite overkill. Uh, 12 seems to be the, the sort of safe middle. So we have four deployed in this infrastructure because we've got um, some. Uh, the, it, I took this diagram from a project I'm currently running, and we uh, we are running uh, some quite resource intensive and quite a lot of external workflows. So that's going to take um, take a lot of time basically on on both the the dem workers so we've deployed for. Um, of course, VC ops can also be utilized to tell you if these machines are oversized or undersized. Um, so you can size them based on, on what VC ops tells you if you're restricted for resource in your management cluster. <coughs> so like we've said here, we've uh, we, just to recap, we can run 15 current workflows, CPU intensive, may need DEM resources increased, stub workflows, lengthy workflows can extend the time for a workflow to execute. And uh, we also deploy some. We have in, in mind that there may be failures of uh, of the dem service, or maybe even possibly uh, failures of the uh, operating system. So we always try to to give n plus one. So next thing we look at our agents. And um, like I was saying here, we're using uh, the vSphere based agent. So these are uh, again, this brings up a lot of discussion here. We, we talk very often about the placement of the of the VC. AC agents and the placement of the dem workers inside the uh, the architecture. So the reference architecture states that the, the VCAC agent should be installed on each dem worker. So uh, in this instance here, we, we, we're going to have two virtual centers when I expand out the uh, the diagram. So we've got two agents installed. Um, the initial stages we discussed, we were going to install an agent on each virtual center rather than on the um, the actual dem workers. The reason for that being that the the traffic between the agents and the virtual center is more intensive than the traffic between the, the workers um, and the um, the agent. So, for example, when we were monitoring traffic in our engineering department, we, we saw that the the, the amount of of, uh, of chat we had between the the agent and the V center was was massive, and the agents actually only pull information from the the sorry the then workers only pull information from the agents based on the time that we configure or um, maybe other provisioning activities or services that they need to talk to it for. So we can control the chat between the, the dem worker and the agent, but the agent to the v center is, is something we, we can't control. Um, so we decided we were going to place the agents either on the virtual centers or right next to them. The dem workers, we, uh, we looked again at where to place these um, in a multi-site configuration. If you've got a centralized management cluster, where um, very often people will deploy the DEMs at different different sites, different locations, different geos. That's that that's been a recommendation for a very long time, and, and still is a recommendation. But in the uh, in some instances, it can be possible to to put the DEM workers local with the components 
and then have your resources, whether they be geo or, or, or multi-site in the same uh, country, to um, to put the workers out in these different locations for them to execute workflows closer to the to the agents and to the provisioning infrastructure. There's no, um, I, I would like to say there's a hard set rule, but there, there is no, sort of in my experience, there's no definite, uh, this is where you should place them. The reference architecture has been been published and developed based on, on loads of testing in our engineering department, and, and they state that, um, it states sorry, but, but in some circumstances the, the workers should be placed with the um, with the uh, endpoints at, at the geographical locations. Um, the traffic between the den workers uh, and the manager service and, and the VCSC appliance as well and the IIS components is actually and the VCO appliance, uh, appliances cluster site is actually quite intensive. So uh, based on some of the links that, that my last customer had, we actually decided to place the uh, den workers actually in the decentralized management cluster, which was, um, which for example, was in London, but they were provisioning uh, at locations in uh, Sheffield and in um, Kent as well. So they had the, uh, all of the workers placed in, in the management cluster because of the amount of traffic that was being sent from the all the components to the workers and then from the uh, the workers to the agents that the traffic isn't massive. Like I was saying, we can control it. So I have any questions around that? That's, that's sometimes quite a, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of discussion that you can have on that and, and a lot of pros and cons. Um, I'd probably recommend if you're, if you're deploying it at a customer that you, you sort of evaluate what their links are, what their network looks like and whether, um, whether they can either sacrifice the traffic that's going to be between the den workers and all of the other components, or if they um, if they can sacrifice maybe one or two seconds during provisioning time. Um, Phil, I suppose the only thing, uh, obviously, the, uh, the, the the Dems run a number of, if you like, internal uh, workflows and scheduled tasks, uh, as well yeah. as any related to provisioning and things like that as well, don't they? So I suppose that's got to be a factor in terms of yeah, sizing and, and, and scaling of them um, is, is, is factoring in all those scheduled workflows that are going to have to kick off as well that are going to take away from that, that number of 15 that you've got available per host. Yeah, it does, yes. So for example, if you're doing an, an infantry or a state collection on, on your virtual center, then that's obviously a running workflow, so that, that's going to have to, um, that takes up one of those 15 slots. And if you're doing um, a reclamation request on network profiles, for example, that would take some, one of those 15 workflows as well. Um, so it is, it's, it's not, a, I don't see why it's not larger, to be honest, but it, it's what the product is at the moment, I suppose. Maybe in a future yeah. release that might be increased. Indeed. Okay. So uh, again, going to um, uh, our agents discussion, we, we failover and resilience in the agents as well, we, I didn't really touch on that actually. That's um, something that that is discussed quite a lot as well. So, so you can only have one agent active per virtual center, but you can have multiple agents with the same name, um, which are configured on different machines, pointing to the same virtual center. So, if we um, if we go back to our diagram here, I could have Den Worker One and Den Worker Two with a, with a, a VCAC agent one installed on them with exactly the same name, but one of them would be turned off, uh, disabled, and a manual start, and then one of them would be active. Uh, and then if the active one on Denworker 01, for example, fails, we could go in and manually start the, the agent on Denworker 02, or we could orchestrate that failover if we wanted to. Um, so like I was saying, the reference architecture says to install the agents on the DEMs. Um, I don't always do that. There's use cases for and against it. Um, some customers are actually been to have been in system that we installed them on their own boxes. Uh, that is very much overkill. They don't tend to be that resource intensive. They just constantly talk, but but don't don't do a massive amount of work. Okay. okay. So if we look at the the final diagram completed, uh, this example I've used VBlocks because uh, my last few customers I've been running this on had have, have used VBlocks. Um, we fill out we have uh, our S, our virtual centres with our NSX managers for each virtual center. That's a very common setup. If you've got networking that's going to be confined, um, you have to, well, for NSX to work, it has to have a, a manager installed per virtual center. You can't 
it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship you can't share uh, managers between multiple virtual centers and then we have our, our resource different set different uh, B blocks at different locations so the endpoints here like I was saying earlier we focused on vCenter if this was vCloud director um, it'd be different there wouldn't be NSX uh, integrates with vCloud director but, but not greatly um, not on the lines of what VCNS does, so we would replace that with VCNS if we were using uh, we're using uh, vCloud Direct. So if we're using something like uh, VCHS or uh, AWS or, or Azure, even then uh, the endpoint is obviously uh, an external endpoint which goes over the internet. Um, we do have customers that that use all three of those. The the more common one, because obviously we're we're selling it harder, is VCHS, and, and it integrates as you would expect better with our products than. Um, and third party companies like Microsoft and Amazon. Okay. So does um does anyone have any questions? No, no, no one typing anything, in. Michael? <laughs> no, nothing coming in. Okay, cool. So that was uh was very quick, I think. how, how are we doing for time, Michael? Um, oodles of time left, um, as much as you want, basically. Okay, so um, so we've got uh, we've covered all the different layers, the, the external services. We didn't cover ITBM, so so ITBM is uh, an appliance-based IT business management tool, which does the costing services for VCAC. So we uh, this is deployed as part of the the, uh, the suite. And um, very often we install the standard edition to try and demonstrate to customers what the appliance can offer. Um, it will compare your clouds based on the costings that you manually input into uh, to other clouds. You, for example, you could uh, put in your cloud information costing that you want to do for recovering your cost of your hardware. Um, and it will tell you how you compare per virtual machine to something like Amazon or, or something like BCHS. Or if you really want to, it'll even tell you if you're uh, cheaper than an existing cloud in your infrastructure or a competitor's cloud. So we're seeing uh, ITBM now being rolled out by some of our partner companies to be used to uh, to sort of show how how cheaper they are or, or how competitive their costs are compared to to other cloud partners and other cloud providers. Um, there is an enterprise edition of, of ITBM which substitutes for the reporting capabilities of VCAC. So 5.1 and 5.2 versions of VCAC had some, some very, uh, they weren't basic, but they weren't advanced. They were sort of in the middle reporting capabilities where you could report how many virtual machines you provision, resources you're using, um, uptimes, loads of stuff. Um, that was all removed in 6.0 when, when when that level, that self-service portal and, and that VCAC portal was migrated into appliances. It wasn't something that was, was coded up and, and migrated into that level. So ITBM substitutes for being able to provide some of the reporting capabilities. Uh, it also um, provides a lot more detailed reports than, than what was previously available in 5.1 and 5.2 versions of VCAC. So uh, if any of you guys are, are actually deploying VCAC into a customer at the moment, and I would definitely recommend that you, you deploy the standard version of ITBM, which should be included in most license levels of the suite um, to be able to demonstrate what it does. And then if the customer would like uh, the advanced edition, because there's a lot more work in installing the advanced edition than the standard one, then you can, you can put forward a, a case for installing that and configuring it. Um, so we, we glanced over VCO clustering as well. So, so VCO clustering uh, is definitely something that, that needs to be considered if you're running an enterprise VCAC installation. Um, it's very easy to set up. It's not very difficult at all. The external services are not an arrow one here, actually. I don't know where it's gone, but it, uh, it connects to the SQL database for its database. Um, and, and it's even in the appliance or the Windows mode, it can be deployed in a clustered or multi-site configuration. We, uh, we're seeing more and more of the appliance-based uh, VCO instances being deployed rather than the Windows components. I was just um, about to ask you about that actually. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's starting to pick up a lot more. Um, yeah. The only the only real use case for uh, for running the Windows one at the moment that we we see with customers is if they want to run um, command line scripts or or sometimes if they want to run PowerShell scripts that are embedded into the um, 
into the actual VCI Windows instance. Um, obviously, you can't yeah. get a, a command line. I mean, ultimately, I suppose, with, 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 particularly with the PowerShell, you can at least configure an external server to execute those scripts on, even if you're using the appliance. But Yeah, you um, can, in the same manner that you can configure a, an SSH um, location yeah. as well to execute SSH scripts. It's, it's very similar in the way it's configured for that. It's just a command line, basically, the, uh, the CMD prompts. You can't see on a Linux appliance. You can't do that. Yeah. Um, so have you deployed the appliance much, Michael? Um, mostly in my lab, um, other projects I'm working on, they're still using the, the Windows uh, installed version, um, which is kind of fine because I, I do need to use PowerShell as, uh, for, for, for some of the things I've been doing. But um, um, yeah, I, I find them fairly interchangeable, definitely. Um, Certainly, when it comes to you know the client and things like that, you you barely know which one you're working on, to be honest. So, um, um, yeah, certainly with the, the the VCO that comes embedded with the uh, with the VCAC appliance, um, obviously tend not to use that quite so much. Um, uh, partly because like the identity appliance, I suppose, in a way, and and, and the vPostgres that's built into VCAC appliance, it, it's it's kind of a single point of failure in some respects. You can't make it highly available in quite the same way as you can do as if you take VCO out of the VCAC appliance. So. Yeah, completely. Um, yeah, I, I, I imagine it will probably, uh, uh, the, the use of the appliances will probably take off quite a lot more um, in the next couple of years. Uh, doubt, doubt you'll see many people still using the Windows version of um, um, VCO that much longer. Yeah, definitely. And the um, the only the only uh, downfall I think is probably that we we don't offer any we well, we don't allow any third party agents to be installed into the, the Linux based OS. So mm. a lot of customers, you know, they're not very happy with that because they want monitoring agents installed and and backup agents installed and, and things like that rather than having to do a whole backup every time, etc. But um, yeah, it's getting it's slowly getting more and more. And I think um, as we we go forward, we might we might even see releases of some of these uh, appliances with uh, with agents integrated in them specifically for for different vendors. Yeah, which would obviously be good. Cool. So we uh, we've just about covered most things. Um, is there any questions? Otherwise, I think um, I think we're sort of done. I've um, got nothing coming in at the moment. Come on, someone will be brave and ask a question. <laughs> Uh, one quick sort of, if you like, housekeeping type question. Uh, is, is, is there any chance you could um, send me through a copy of this uh, diagram? It's, it's, it's come through. It's, it's slightly small to look at. Um, but um, if we can kind of post it up with the, uh, uh, with the show notes and the, and the recording, might be handy. Yeah, sure. No problem, of course. Uh, this is from our... Um one of our delivery kits. So if you're a VMware partner and you've got access to Partner Central, then this um, this diagram will be readily available to you as well. Yeah, if I'm, I'm too lazy to log in this evening. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think most people are. Indeed. Any questions, anyone, about anything that uh, Phil said about uh, VCAC architecture um, or anything on a related topic, I guess? Excellent. I don't suppose there's any sort of little hints or nuggets you can drop about um, any of the sort of architectural changes that will come through in the next version about any sort of components that are going to be moving from Windows-based to, to, to appliance-based at all, or uh, are we just going to have to wait and see? Um, unfortunately, you're just going to have to wait and see. So uh, 6.1 is due for release. Um, I think it was... It was meant to be released uh, fairly soon, but I think it's been uh, been pipped by uh, something else to be released at VMworld. So um, it might be it might be end of this year, or it might be the start of next. But um, you you will see. I can tell you some features that, that are openly told on the uh, communities that can be integrated with it. So things like dynamic types. Uh, if you log on to the um, VMware communities you, and look at Christoph's posts, you'll see that he's posted quite a lot about dynamic types and its its integration between. Um, 
BCO and uh, some of our products like NSX and um, so even some external things. I think one of his um, articles he put up on his on his website, BCO team, was uh, around creating a dynamic type plugin for for Twitter. Just it's just a functionality that, that takes a, an API and creates objects basically for us to be able to to use um, in BCAC and, and and in other programmable manners. Indeed, yes. That, 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 yeah, it's uh, certainly uh, certainly helped me out on the project I'm on. Uh, one of my colleagues got um, very, uh, shall we say, um, busy with it and um, was quite happily creating different types, if you like, that we could then provision back into the VCAC portal um, as effectively as objects for, for, for the anything as a service um, type offerings. So um, yeah, so you yeah. do that with the advanced service designer to be able to add uh, day two actions onto it as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so a common thing we see are um, is using of NSX is using it to do things like creating uh, a load balancer in a customer's cloud if they want to create a load balancer, then that's defined as an object in the active in the advanced service designer, and then you can assign actions to that to be able to do things like add nodes, add rules, and etc. and load balance methods, etc. and so on. Yeah. Um, so anything you, you can define in the ASD, you can add actions to to be able to create stuff. So uh, dynamic types and there's something else as well as a plugin for a product. Um, NSX is going to be going to be released and supported in the next version of VCAC and VCA. Cool. Awesome. Sounds good. Right. Um, well, wow. so there's a few more of these I think I'm lined up to do as well, and I, I think they're going to be uh, they're going to be a bit more a bit longer because they'll have a lot more information in them. This is the uh, setting the boundary. The next one I think um, is going is, is around service design. I believe is that right, Michael? I can't remember which one's the next one. I honestly I haven't got it in front of me, so I can't remember. But <laughs> um, yes, we've certainly got some uh, some some further sessions with you lined up. So um, looking forward to seeing those as well, um, and. Um, yeah, I guess we'll uh, we'll see you again next week. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Phil, and uh, it's been a pleasure. And um, I'll we'll have to catch up for a beer sometime. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right, thank you, everybody. Same time next week. Phil will be back uh, talking either about service design um, or something similar to do with VCAC. Um, we'll post the topic on Twitter uh, and everywhere else, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Cool. Thanks.